Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, all of you uh, joining us uh, quite literally from around the world. Uh, it's tremendous to see to see so, so many of you uh, uh, joining and, and with, with an interest in this subject. Um, it's probably the highest profile topic uh, in the art market right now, uh, whether NFTs are here to stay or whether they turn out to be a, a bit more ephemeral than that uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but they do raise uh, all sorts of legal issues uh, which require attention and understanding and, and some of which we're going to touch on today. Um, the art market also has to make up its own mind about them and what it thinks of them. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome on to our, our otherwise lawyer panel, uh, Charles uh, Cochran, who will bring a, a, a non-legal perspective to the session and we'll, uh, and we'll look at it from the art market's perspective. Um, if we could have the the slides up now please just so i can do the rest of the introductions and then the next one okay so so, 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 I, so uh, that's me uh, i'll be chairing and and speaking briefly later on about artist resale royalties uh, ben signal my partner will, will start off um uh, and introduce the subject and some of the issues uh, and Charles Cochran will uh, follow on um, from from Ben with the art market perspective and then also, and then Alex Peigel, uh, my intellectual property partner will deal with IP issues um, and and then we go back to can we can we go on to the next slide thank you and then um, Alan Ward one of our senior associates will talk about uh, the AML aspects and whether there's anything particular to watch out for there and Alice Vink, another senior associate at Stevenson Harwood, will address uh, issues around gifts and succession in relation to these uh, uh, somewhat intangible uh, objects. Um, and then at the end, there's going to be time for, for, for questions. Um, please use the Q&A button, uh, which uh, should be at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, and I'll, I, will, I will take those questions at the end um, and, and uh, uh, direct them to the appropriate member of the panel uh, in each case. Um, so without more ado, Ben, um, over to you. Um, so uh, uh, the first, the first uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of what NFTs are and how they work and how they're created, I thought it's worth worth, worth just reflecting on why we're talking about this and it, in essentially um, it's because in the Wall Street bets parlance um, NFTs have gone to the moon um, their sales have reached an eye-watering two billion in the first quarter of this year uh, and although things have slowed down a little bit since then um, interest in this area doesn't seem to have abated um, You'll see on the next slide um, some examples of, uh, of recent uh, transactions uh, which, are, which have garnered some fairly high profile. You've obviously got the eponymous sale of Beeple's uh, Everydays, which sold for 69 million in March. Um, uh, a crypto punk, which uh, Charles will be showing you later, one of, uh, of 10,000 sold for 11.75 million in June. Um, at, at auction in Sotheby's. Um, separately, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, sold his first tweet um, <laughs> for $2.9 million uh, in March. Um, and the New York Times published an article um, uh, which it then minted as an NFT um, for approximately half a million dollars. Um, so as you can see, uh, it's it's uh, you, you, you'll have your own view as to whether those are logical prices, but it's... Uh, it's certainly a market which is commanding um, significant uh, revenues at the moment. So, um, what is an NFT? Um, NFTs are, are cryptographic tokens which are stored on blockchains, um, typically the Ethereum blockchain, although Flow and Wax are also popular blockchains used for NFTs. Um, Taking a step back, what is a blockchain? A blockchain um, can, is, a, is a permanent, unchangeable distributed ledger which is used to record transactions on chain um, in blocks of code that are time stamped and linked together. Uh, and each uh, user of the, that blockchain will have a copy of that blockchain in its entirety on their computer. And they 
validation it happens in a variety of different ways as to those transactions but um, primarily it's, it's through everyone having a, uh, an exact replica of that blockchain uh, hosted on their node um, those blockchains can be public um, like in, in the case of uh, the Bitcoin um, blockchain or private and there's um, an example on the slide called as uh, R3 open source blockchain which is used in, in bank, banking transactions. Um, the blockchain structure provides an immutable record of the provenance um, uh, of the digital token stored on the chain so it shows every single transaction since that um, particular digital token was minted so you can see um, when it was created and then to whom it's been transferred to um, subsequently um, and upon what date and at what time. Um, the difference between um, NFTs and cryptocurrencies is that unlike cryptocurrencies, um, which are fungible, um, i.e. any blockchain, is, uh, any sorry, any Bitcoin can be transferred in exchange for another and it has the same characteristics other than obviously it's, uh, it's transaction history. NFTs aren't interchangeable. Uh, essentially because they store additional information relating to uh, an asset to, to which they're associated. Um, and the attraction, obviously, of that association is that um, purchasers um, can uh, build a collection of uh, these digital assets, or at least these, these digital tokens associated with digital assets. Um, and uh, it's, it's led to them, NFTs at least, being popularized in the context of the sale of unique digital products products such as digital arts, digital collectibles, uh, such as sports highlights videos, so that's NBA's Top Shot. Um, you've seen it used um, for releases of music, so Kings of Leon recently released an NFT in the context of uh, their latest album, which uh, provided a few add-ons in addition to the music itself, so preferential rights to um, front row seats at shows and, and such like. Uh, and they're also frequently used in online gaming um, in terms of in-game purchases um, and in-game items, so some kinds of uh, special sword or uh, the such like in Zelda, uh, for those of you that are games. Um, the majority of NFTs are uh, reside on the Ethereum blockchain, um, and you'll see the um, ERC721 token standard is, is typically used for most NFTs, although there are new standards being developed um, as we speak. Um, and they're sort of smart contracts and the smart contracts essentially contain the attributes which enforce limitations on the use of uh, the NFT by a purchaser. So they provide for automatic royalty payments on resale, which which one we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, and they demonstrate proof of ownership, amongst other things. Um, the, a key point to note about NFTs is by virtue of the way the blockchains work, and, and, and I described earlier that each node has a, a, a complete copy of the transaction history of every digital token on that um, on that blockchain, um, you, you can't host um, large volumes of data um, on the blockchain. Um, so all of the NFTs um, that, we'll, that we'll be talking about um, comprise two aspects. There's an, the entry on the blockchain which reflects the sort of minting and the accounting of, of that particular digital token. Um, and separately, there's an asset which sits behind that, of which that digital token denotes ownership. Um, and the NFT, the token, um, will contain a link to that asset, typically, where it's a, a digital asset. Um, in principle, there's no reason why it couldn't be a phys physical asset. Um, and that digital asset will be linked elsewhere. So it will be located elsewhere on a server online and the, um, and the digital token will contain a link to that asset. It's important to note that when you're buying an NFT, you're buying the digital token and not the underlying asset that's linked to the token. Um, that link doesn't automatically result in any uh, transfer of rights or obligations regarding the underlying asset and the extent to which there is any transfer of title in the underlying asset um, is a matter of contract so that's going to be um, a matter between purchaser and seller so it's in, in principle the contract of sale for the digital token may include associated rights and may even include 
the, the transfer of possession of the asset or a copy of the asset, but it won't necessarily do so. Um, and it's worth noting that NFTs can also include um, in the digital token uh, a link to off-chain information about the digital token itself, which could uh, potentially include some more detailed contractual rights about um, uh, or a more detailed level of information about the contractual rights, which flow um, with ownership of the digital token. So not all of the of the um, of the rights um, attendant on the contract will be coded into the smart contract itself. So you covered what an NFT is. How do we go about creating and selling one? Essentially, this is a this is a, a three stage process. So an artist creates a work, and that work is uploaded to a marketplace, for example, OpenSea, um, and the artist then associates that digital token, um, uh, that, sorry, that, that work with a digital token which has already been minted, so it's already existent on the blockchain. And the artist pays uh, money or, or gas in NFT world uh, for doing so, and, and that, that can be between $100 uh, ranging up to uh, $1,500. Um, the artist then consigns that NFT for direct sale on, on that marketplace platform, um, which, which trades on the relevant blockchain. So um, depending on which blockchain um, the uh, work has been minted, the NFT has been minted, um, you'll choose an appropriate marketplace accordingly. Um, and once the NFT, or if the NFT has been sold to a purchaser, um, the smart contract, uh, which which is reflected in the NFT, will self-execute um, on uh, a relevant event stipulated in in that smart contract. Uh, typically, payment to the artist in um, in the relevant um, currency, and title at that point in the digital token is transferred to the purchaser. Uh, and it's worth just noting that the process can entire occur entirely on chain, um, so. T totally automatically or partially on on chain um, with elements off chain so some some level of off chain verification which is then um, uh, there's a human element which um, uh, is necessary in order to complete the transaction and it's just worth noting um, that the people sale um, was actually partially off chain and uh, many purists uh, in crypto world considered it to be a marketing stunt for that reason. It wasn't um, sufficiently perfect from their perspective. So what are some of the legal issues which uh, NFTs engage in? And as Rayland indicated, they are myriad. There are issues around um, ownership rights. Um, there's a, there's the, the typical uh, Bitcoin related question who owns who owns the underlying digital token um, ultimately um, ownership is reflected by um, the uh, key to the digital wallet in which the relevant digital tokens held um, if two people have that key that can create evidential problems as to who owns it um, ultimately I think this is probably less of an issue than a lot of people in crypto world consider it to be. Um, and actually, Craig Wright, who purports to be Satoshi Nakamoto, the developer behind Bitcoin, has written quite a good piece on this where he effectively says that law um, as a whole has no problem with assets being held on trust and there's no reason why these, these assets shouldn't be treated accordingly. Um, so I think it's more of an evidential problem than a, than a technical legal problem problem but um, worth bearing in mind um, and that kind of issue um, is relevant in the context of succession and, and Alex, Alice will touch on this further when she uh, talks later. Um, then you've got the issue which I highlighted earlier about recourse um, in the event of the loss of the underlying work um, due to um, server being offline or, or, or otherwise so the, obviously we have our we have our digital token and we continue to hold our digital token and our ownership of that digital token is reflected in the blockchain. But what you might have is a dud link within that digital token. So I can no longer access um, the digital um, work with which it's associated. I can't watch watch my video of a basketball player um, performing that highlight or, or 
will look at this um, digital image. Um, and there's various reasons why a server might go down, there might be system outages, or there might be non-payment of hosting fees by the, um, uh, the server, uh, uh, the person that's got the, the contract with the server host. So um, that creates um, a variety of issues. Um, there may not be a direct, direct claim against the issuer um, by the NFT owner because it may have gone through a number of sales thereafter um, following being minted and initially sold. Um, and if the assets lost for good, that, that gives rise to some interesting questions around intellectual property, um, which which uh, Alex will uh, touch on later. Um, and just, just to note, there are solutions to this problem. I've identified uh, the interplanetary file system, which is um, a, a sort of, again, a, a decentralized um, way of holding digital assets in a permanent way. Um, the, the final, um, Point worth noting here is there is a developing uh, fractionalized market in NFTs, which is uh, a, a way of having a synthetic access or a partial ownership of, a, of an NFT. Um, and uh, there's a there's a developing market in that regard, which again um, engages further questions about ownership of particular assets. Uh, other issues which are engaged, resale rights, which Rich Brennan's going to be talking about, intellectual property rights, which Alex will be talking about um, a little bit later, including the topic which I just touched on. Um, you've got the question of whether you can use NFTs as security um, to secure indebtedness. Uh, in principle, that's possible. Uh, personally, it, it, if I was a lender, I'd feel pretty uncomfortable um, about securing against uh, NFTs because you've got a sort of double layer of volatility risk in the sense that not only are their NFTs um, extremely volatile in their value, um, but, but um, they typically require transactions uh, to be undertaken in cryptocurrencies to, um, if you're trying to extract value out. Um, and again, those currencies are highly volatile. So there's a, there's a very difficult um, valuation question uh, uh, there if one is trying to use uh, NFTs uh, as security. Um, you've got questions of AML and financial regulation, which, which Alan's going to discuss further. Um, you've got issues around data protection, um, GDPR, uh, and uh, blockchain don't sit very well together. They're almost mutually exclusive in the sense that GDPR has a uh, a concept of the right to be forgotten um, and uh, blockchains <laughs> the sole purpose is to create an immutable ledger which is unalterable um, so that, that they, they, they butt up against each other in that regard although there's obviously aspects of anonymization um, in, in, in uh, blockchain transactions which to some extent ameliorate that, that problem uh, and then obviously uh, as with every um, every transaction, there are tax issues uh, engaged. Ben, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, next up, Charles, you're going, to, you're going to take a different approach and, and tell us what the market thinks of these things. I look forward to that. Thank, thanks, Rodan, um, very much. <laughs> and, and Ben, um, <clears throat> I, I'll s introduce myself a little bit more of what I do in the art world. I'm, I'm an agent. Um, and, and so I act for, for sellers and buyers, and, and they're my clients. I don't actually own the artwork myself. I advise them. Um, and listening to Ben, what was interesting is how technically complicated um, the, the whole cryptocurrency or, or crypto world is behind the image that you're looking at. Um, anyway, most people, it seems to me, in terms of the world of NFT, have been looking at the, the legal aspects and the technical aspects of, 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 of crypto um, work or NFT works. And what I want to do is look at, um, are they any good as art? And, and how do they fit within a, an established art market? And I, I imagined myself being um, uh, asked by a, a potential buyer whether I should buy a work of art or not that's an NFT. Um, and that's what I'm going to try and talk to you about now for, for, for about 10 minutes. Um, and I think the first thing to do would be to look at uh, post-war contemporary art as the, the obviously nearest um, category within the art market. Um, 
and, and to look at that in a little bit of detail and to see whether how NFTs relate to that market. Um, and in the post-war contemporary market, one's really looking at the contemporary part, i.e. The, the, um, the part where the, you've got living artists um, creating new works of art and, and creating a career for themselves. And when I say creating a career, it's really the galleries um, who are um, looking after a living artist and promoting that artist into becoming the great artists such as Hockney, for instance, although he's, he's, he's old now, but there are lots of galleries out there looking after artists and building them up from nothing from art school. And that's the primary market. Um, you then have dealers and auction houses who um, are in the secondary market where there's an established market outside of the gallery. Um, and, and that's your buying and selling platform. Um, there are also academics and writers and critics, for instance, who will be talking about um, at the, context, the contextualization of, of the artwork, allowing people to understand how important a work of art is, and particularly putting it in some sort of art historical record. Um, when you put all of that together, you get a, a, an ability from an art point of view to be able to evaluate a particular work of art against any other group of works of art that, that come up for sale in a particular season. Um, now, let's take that and then let's, let's look at what um, it surrounds the NFT world. Now, the first thing I'll say is I'm no expert on NFTs, but then again, who is? I, I think that's a really big question because there are no critics uh, that I know of. There are no um, academics. There, there's no one writing about the art, um, particularly that I know of. There are no museums broadly, although there is one museum who's collected an NFT. Um, if you look at the market, the buying and selling side of it, what is incredible is that there are the artists themselves who started off by um, making these works and then selling them to each other and people within the cryptocurrency world, but that was a sealed environment. Um, and once the, the next part out of the market from, from, from that little group has been the auction houses. In other words, the market is made up purely by the artists and at auction. Now that's really interesting because for other contemporary artists, galleries are the ones who are slowly building up a relationship between price and value and market and allowing a, a, um, an artist to actually move into the secondary market, i.e. To, to, to auction and, and dealers. Uh, all of that is just not, not present with NFTs. Um, NFTs, as I said, were, were made by artists within a, you know, quite a sort of politically, a, quite a left-wing political um, sort of commune-based environment. Um, and I think what changed all of that was the pandemic, because um, the auction houses moved online, as the whole art world did. Um, and at some point, auction and the NFT world um, hooked up as a perfect sort of digital expression. Um, and so you now have, as, as I said, this, this, this relationship purely between auction and, 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 um, and, and the artists themselves. Um, I haven't shown you a, a slide of Beeple's 5,000 works because frankly, um, it, it's not quite a meaningless collage, but there are 5,000 works packed into the, the lot that he sold. Um, and it's only when you focus in on a particular work out of that collage of 5,000 works that you can actually see what you would normally associate as a visual work of art. Now, he produced um, over 13 years, 5,000 works that he then sold uh, uh, last year. Now, the work itself was given uh, uh, by Christie's, gave them a, a, an estimate of it sort of in the low thousands, and it then sold for $69 million, which was astonishing. Um, what was interesting is that that work was only sold as a, as a digital work. That, that there's no physical expression. Now, moving to the slide that I, I put up here of the cryptocurrency, uh, sorry, the CryptoPunk, that was offered at Sotheby's last week and sold for, for £150,000. There were five others uh, that all presented in the same format. And what's interesting about the development of the NFT market within a year from an art perspective is that three items, and the most important item was offered here, was a, a physical printout, which you can see at the top part of this um, slide, of the crypto punk it's signed by the artist it's dated by the artist in pencil and it's marked one of one i.e it is a print but it is uh, uh, there is this is the only print ever created by the artist and has been signed off by the artist as uh, as accepted by the artist below it you have what i hope you can see is a, a an envelope sealed with sealing wax which is very 
sort of aristocratic old fashioned thing to do within which there's a token and then there's a QR code below it. And the whole thing is makes up the lot that, that, that was bought for 150,000 pounds. But what's interesting here is that it, clearly this is not just a, a, um, a digital purchase. Um, th this is a physical purchase. And I wonder whether that's what artists are thinking of, NFT artists, that they need to move out of a purely digital experience if they're going to move into a post-war and contemporary buying market. And I say that because um, as far as I understand of the art market, no post-war contemporary buyers um, have actually bought um, NFTs yet. So in other words, the big question I have is who is buying um, these works of art? And my, my assumption is it's people who are in the cryptocurrency world and, and it's really a cryptocurrency market that they're getting involved with or, or, or something along those lines. And it's not really an art market because a lot of what you need for an art market, as I've said earlier, um, it isn't there. So it's, it's really hard to say to a buyer, how do you evaluate whether one, one, one NFT is better than another? I also wonder if I was going to talk to this imagined buyer, what happens when the pandemic recedes and people start going back to seeing art in the flesh? And after all, the art world is a physical, you know, you actually need to view the, art, the work. That's what you're buying is a physical work whether there will also be a recession from NFTs. It would be very interesting because I think unless galleries start to get involved um, and museums and critics start getting involved, it's going to be very hard to entice the rest of the art market, particularly the post-war contemporary market, to start buying into this. My final comment, I think, is what struck me is the amount of money that's being spent on this artwork. Because if you compare it to video art, which really doesn't attract big sums of money at all, um, it's difficult to see why that video art is, is so lo low in value and the NFT works are so high in value. Um, that gap between what appears to be value and price is something that worries me very much. Uh, however, um, this may not turn out to be a bubble. This may well be the beginning of something new and, uh, and will become accepted. So I, I don't want to sound too negative, but I think at the moment I would be telling my imaginary buyer, wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Charles, for, the, for, for those remarks. So they're they're uh, sobering, I think. <laughs> um, we'll, 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 you'll have picked up from, from what Ben was saying earlier that, that intellectual property rights are, are a key ingredient um, in, in these, these, these new instruments. And, and Alex uh, Peigel is now going to address some of the IP issues that arise. Thanks, Roland. Um, yes, I'm going to cover uh, a couple of areas. First of all, I'm going to talk about what, what is actually acquired when one acquires an NFT, and, and Ben headlined that I'd be talking about that. So that's my first topic of, of discussion. And then I'm going to cover three areas of IP risk uh, when acquiring an artwork by virtue of an NFT. First of all, I'm going to talk about the risk of there being an, an underlying infringement in the artwork which you are acquiring. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about counterfeit NFTs. Um, and thirdly, I'm going to talk about some moral rights aspects. So quite a lot to cover. And actually, in preparing for this, I discovered I could have talked for hours on this. So I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I stick to my allotted uh, 10 minutes. So starting off with, first of all, this, this slightly tricky question of what, what you actually acquire when you acquire an NFT from, a, from an IP perspective. Um, I think the first point is uh, read the terms and conditions, because every NFT is, is different and unique. Um, and and what, you, what you acquire is what is set out in the contract. But typically, uh, when you acquire an artwork through an NFT, you do not un acquire the underlying copyright um, in the artwork. And the consequence of that is it means that artists are free to make and sell further copies. It means that you as a buyer cannot make or sell further copies or sell merchandise um, on which you have applied uh, the artwork. And generally, although not always, the artwork remains visible online to others after the purchase. Um, even if the terms and conditions do purport to transfer copyright, there's a question, and this is a sort of nice legal question, but there's a question about whether that's actually legally valid. Um, certainly in the UK, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act requires that an assignment of copyright is in writing and signed by or on behalf of the assignor. So the question is, even if the terms and conditions of your NFT say that the copyright is transferred, is that actually effective? 
What I would say, however, is I don't actually, having reflected on this, think that's terribly different um, to making a traditional um, art purchase. If I was to acquire one of Charles's uh, post-war contemporary artworks, I, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to acquire the copyright in that either, and I can't put that on merchandise. Um, and, and, and I suppose, theoretically, the artist could, could create other similar works in the future, and I wouldn't be able to stop them from doing that. So from a copyright aspect, we need to be clear about what's being assigned or what's being acquired and what isn't. But I don't think it's actually terribly different to, to a more traditional um, artwork from a copyright perspective. So next slide, please, Sarah. And um, if you could just go back one. No, you've gone. That's perfect, thanks. Um, so when you look at the terms and conditions of these NFTs, here's a, a, a sort of a list of the, the categories of, of areas which the terms and conditions generally cover. We've talked about ownership and we're going to come on now to talk about the terms of the license which you do actually acquire. Um, and there are other aspects which are addressed in the terms and conditions such as risk allocation, indemnities, disclaimers and limitations on liability. So these really are quite bespoke um, contracts which you have to be um, looking at from a buyer's perspective. You also need to check whether you're buying from a marketplace or whether you're buying from the artist directly when you're reading these terms and conditions and I'm going to go on now to show you an example of each. So here's an example of marketplace T's and C's and Ben talked earlier about OpenSea which is the marketplace on which the crypto punks um, have been sold as well as other artworks and I've just highlighted a couple of clauses from their terms and conditions just to give you a flavor of what the marketplace t's and c's look like and in bold I've, I've highlighted a couple of things i thought were interesting so they first of all state that obviously OpenSea is um it facilitates transactions but it's not a party to the agreement between the buyer and the seller as you would expect it then goes on to say that you as the buyer bear full responsibility for verifying the identity the legitimacy and the authenticity of the assets. So if you have a problem with whatever you purchase, the marketplace isn't going to help you. That, that's very much at your own risk. Next slide, please, Sarah. And then um, they do not guarantee that the marketplace, OpenSea, can actually affect the transfer of title or the right in any crypto assets. And the risk of purchasing counterfeit assets, mislabeled assets, assets that are vulnerable to metadata decay, which Ben talked about earlier, Assets on smart contracts with bugs and assets that may in the future become untransferable, that's all at the buyer's risk. So OpenSea acts as a, as a broker, I suppose, um, between buyer and seller, but you, you get no protection um, through having purchased through the marketplace. Next slide, please. And we've talked earlier about what you can acquire on OpenSea, crypto punks, which uh, Charles talked about earlier, and, and crypto kitties, if you're more of the, the sort of an animal lover. Um, several of these have been sold in, in really quite significant sums of money. Um, each of these is unique, however, so only one of each crypto kitty exists. So you, at least you know that when you've purchased it, nobody else can purchase the same crypto kitty as you. But what's important in all of these is that the terms between the buyer and the seller are governed by the smart contracts embedded in the blockchain rather than between you and OpenSea. Next slide. And we've talked a bit about Beeple. Beeple is also sold in OpenSea. Um, what I thought would be interesting, this isn't the, the artwork which Christie sold, this is another artwork he's generated um, with an image from every day in 2020 which he's created. But I thought it would just be quite interesting, on the next slide please, uh, just to look at how it looks when you, when you go on to buy this. So you can see here, you can see the headline or the title of the artwork, People Every Day is Raw, and it says here there's 27 of 100. This is a bit, as Charles was describing earlier, you know, the, the prints with, edition, with a number of um, editions. You've got 20, he's going to sell 100 of these works and this is number 27. A bit like, a bit like as I say, buying prints of a photograph or prints of a, an artwork, it's, it's limited in quantity. And then you, have, you can see the price there quoted in a cryptocurrency but also quoted in the dollar equivalent at that moment in time. And we know of course that cryptocurrencies uh, go up and down significantly in value. And then you can see the trading history, when this was bought and sold and at what price. So that's what you see when you go on to one of these marketplaces to buy an artwork. Next slide. So that was an example of going onto a marketplace and buying an a piece of artwork. This is an example now of buying direct from the owner 
of the artwork as opposed to through a marketplace. And I know this isn't quite art, so bear with me, but it's just to demonstrate the difference between marketplace sales point and, and seller um, owned. So these are NBA moments. And from my limited um, understanding of this, the best analogy is to think about those um, football stickers you used to be able to swap in the playground as a kid or the cigarette cards that you used to collect. So these are NBA moments. And you can see on the yellow box in the bottom left, you can buy a starter pack with a mystery three moments in. From here, I think it's $9. Um, or on the right hand side, you can see you can buy a video clip of, of, of a particular spot shot in the in in the sport this is kevin durant with his dunk and they're selling 499 copies of this video clip and this is the 495th one and you can buy that for a thousand and eighty five um dollars but here the, the critical point as i say is that you're buying direct from the owner of the art if you call it that rather than on a marketplace so if you just go on to the next slide here, here is what you actually get when you buy an MBA moment. You get a user license to the art. Non-exclusive, so you're not the only one getting it. Non-transferable, and query how that relates to the resale point, but anyway. Non-exclusive, non-transferable for your own personal, non-commercial use. And then the, the restrictions continue. I've only highlighted a few points. If you go on to the next slide. There are all these restrictions on your ownership. You may not modify the art. You may not use it to advertise, market, or sell third-party products. You may not sell it or distribute it for commercial gain. You may not use it to commercialize merchandise with the artwork on. And you may not utilize the art for your purchase moment for your or any third party's commercial benefit. So you are buying a limited license to do certain things with, the, the, with your moment that you have purchased. No more than that. Next slide. And also, and we talked about earlier, there may be risks in, in, in the underlying artwork of IP infringement. And so the MBA may have to pass on to you additional restrictions on your ability to use the art if the underlying art is subject to some third party rights. Um, and and they, will, they will be in addition to what's already in their T's and C's. Next slide. So that was, that was a, a sort of slightly non-art example, but purchasing from the seller. Here's one more, um, more art-related example on the Mintable um, platform. So this is another marketplace example. The reason I wanted to show it to you is this is quite a nice presentation in terms of what you're getting. So on the right-hand side, circled in red, you can see this is edition one of one of the artwork known as Jungle. Um, and underneath that, you can see 5% royalty on secondary sales. And Roland's going to come on to explain what that means. And then bottom right hand side, you can see, is the copyright transferred? No. Is it a downloadable file? Yes. Is it resellable? Yes. So I thought this was actually, there's all sorts of T's and C's behind this, but I thought this was at least a nice presentation of what you do and don't get in relation to this particular artwork on Mintable. Next slide. So I've talked about what you acquire, or in fact, what you don't acquire. Now I'm just going to cover quickly these three areas of IP risk, which I've sort of identified when you're purchasing an artwork through an NFT. The first one is this risk that the underlying artwork, in fact, may contain elements which infringe third party IP. And, and, and we're not just talking about copyright here. We could be considering trademarks, passing off unfair competition. And that question of what infringes and what diff doesn't will differ from one country to another. So here's three examples of things which are currently um, available for sale as uh, artworks through the NFT mechanism. I just want to highlight the one on the right hand side as an example. So this is one of the many Beeple uh, images in, his, in the work which Charles talked about earlier. And for those of you in the know, this, this image is uh, a commentary on a, on a TikTok video of a skateboarder who was, skateboard, who was videoed himself skateboarding around, drinking ocean spray cranberry juice um, with Fleetwood Mac playing in the background. And he then wanted to sell his video using an NFT. Um, Fleetwood Mac and Ocean Spray both objected, and he is now trying to sell the video with no Fleetwood Mac music and with the Ocean Spray brand blurred out in his video. So both, both Fleetwood Mac and Ocean Spray objected to the original video. What we've now seen here is people commenting on or an, an image commenting on that TikTok video. But of course, none of those issues we've just identified have been addressed in this particular Beeple image. A query whether that constitutes IP infringement or whether you can squeeze within one of the, the exceptions. Um, 
and again, that answer differs from country to country. I merely sort of highlight this as one of the issues that uh, needs to be considered. Next slide. The second of the three, the three uh, IP risks is, is this issue about counterfeit NFTs. And I've just picked out a couple of tweets that people have, um, have made to demonstrate this. So here, here's an artist saying, I searched my name to make sure my art hadn't been stolen and, and turned into NFTs. And sure thing, an obscure old piece from my deviant art is randomly on the front page of the Marble Cards NFT website. How is this allowed? So here she is identifying her stolen artwork here. And you as the buyer, of course, wouldn't know that this isn't um, being sold by the genuine artist unless you do some thorough due diligence. Next slide. Another example from Derek Kaufman here. Somebody asks him, did you low key release some stuff? I won't tell. He says, this is 100% not me. I thought the point of NFT was that the artwork and artists need to be verified. Apparently it's super easy to scam people. And then um, the, the example that lots of people are talking about is an example um, which was deliberately uh, used or deliberately created to demonstrate the risks of, of NFTs. And this is Monsieur Poisson, who uh, sleep minted, as it's called, um, a, a second edition of People's Every Days. And, and, you know, very hard actually to have told, if you, if you weren't in the know, he's created such a good counterfeit NFT, it's very hard to dig behind it and find out that it's not the genuine NFT. Next slide. So my last, last of three uh, risks is this question about, um, oh sorry, there's just one more NF counterfeit NFT here. This is, a, this is an interesting one. As we all know, um, Banksy's commercialization arm is called uh, Pest Control. And here is somebody called Pest Supply, who created a lookalike Banksy artwork and sold it um, through an NFT. So not a genuine Banksy work at all. Next slide. Last, last topic from me, um, this question about moral rights. So moral rights are owned by the artist and, and they are um, non-transferable, but they can be waived by the artist. They protect the integrity of the artwork and the artist's connection to that artwork. And here in the UK, one of the most important moral rights is your right to object to derogatory treatment, including dist distortion and mutilation. So if we look at the next slide, here we have a genuine Banksy art being destroyed um, by fire. This was videoed and the video of the destruction was sold as an NFT. And apparently the reason for doing this was people believed if the underlying artwork still existed, the NFT would have a lower value. So they wanted to destroy the original artwork to create a higher value um, digital work in the form of the video. The question is, if Banksy had wanted to object to this, could he have used his moral rights to object to the destruction of the video? And the answer in the UK is probably yes, if he chose to, chose to do so. Next slide. And here we have an example where a drawing was to be auctioned as an NFT and the winning bidder was going to be given the option to destroy the original paper, uh, unique copy of the artwork. And again, could, could the artist have used his moral rights to object to that de destruction? In fact, this sale didn't go ahead because the seller didn't have the rights to sell the artwork in the first place. <laughs> so the whole thing was withdrawn from sale. Um, but I thought an interesting example where moral rights might have been a secondary opportunity to prevent that from happening. And I think that's me. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Sale rights, which is a sort of extension of IP in a way. Um, uh, many of you will be, be familiar with the, if I could have, a, have the next slide, please. Um, many of you will be familiar with the existing regime, um, uh, which uh, derived from the EU and was first introduced into the UK in 2006. Um, and slightly surprisingly, it's something that we retained after Brexit. Um, it applies to secondary sales of works by living artists and deceased artists up until 70 years after their death. It's calculated on a sliding scale up to a maximum of 12,500 euros. Uh, and inter interestingly, despite uh, Brexit, it's going to go on being calculated in euros. Um, and it's collected by collection societies uh, who typically levy a, a charge uh, on the artist for doing so of around 15%. Um, 
Um, it doesn't apply uh, to sales between private individuals without the involvement of an art market professional, and it doesn't apply to sales to museums. Um, but it has made a profit on the uh, secondary resale. Now, there are some opportunities here. Uh, can we go back again, Sarah? Thanks. There are some opportunities here um, uh, in, in, the, in, this, in the realm of NFTs. Um, because the smart contract nature of the transaction uh, means that the artist can secure for themselves um, a, a share of the resale price, uh, on, effectively in perpetuity, as a matter of contract. It's embedded in the contract and will get, get passed on from, from, from one buyer to the next. And some of the advantages of that will be, well, there's no cap of 12,500 euros. Um, uh, there's no 15% collection fee payable to the, to the collecting society. There's no private sale exception to the, to the, uh, the right to, to, to acquire this royalty. Um, and uh, it's usually uh, calculated as a percentage of the sale price. We saw in Alex's example earlier, 5% of the resale price. Um, uh, again, there isn't yet any, any, any mechanism I'm aware of for, for limiting that to a percentage of the profit that's made on the resale. So uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the reseller is at, is, is at risk of, um, of, of seeing his, his, um, his, his price eroded somewhat. Um, and, but, but, but the practical consequences of it, or the benefit, can be seen there on the screen in relation to the work Crossroad, also by Beeple, um, which was sold last year uh, for $66,666 and resold this year for a much, much larger sum, $6.6 .6 million, under the conventional, if, if that had been a UK transaction, under the conventional uh, artist resale uh, regime, uh, the maximum that the artist would have collected was €12,500, uh, but at the contractual 10% royalty, provided for in the smart contract there, he collected $660,000. Uh, um, now that all looks great. There are, there are a few, uh, few process issues uh, around this. Um, first of all, if you're, Ben mentioned earlier on the standard um, ERC721 uh, smart contract language. Uh, if you're using that, that does not automatically include an artist resale royalty. So there needs to be some manual intervention uh, to get your to, for the artist to get get their royalty included in in, in the contract, um, and then there's also a practical difficulty at the moment, which is that the resale effectively has to happen on the same platform um, uh, as, as as the platform where the where the NFT is held, uh, because the different platforms generally are not compatible with each other so far as accounting for the ARR is concerned. And of course, the the the, the great benefit of uh, the smart contract um, and the and the and the digital route is that if it's set up correctly, the artist will just automatically collect their royalty um, on, on each resale without um, any any intervention on their part at all. Um, now that's a that's a very very uh, quick uh, uh, little trot through um, that you know, that particular area. Um, I want to hand on now uh, to Alan Ward, who's going to talk about. Um, AML, KYC, and, and due diligence issues. Alan. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, my contribution to this session, as Roland said, concerns another hot topic for the art market, and that is the anti-money laundering regulations, or MLRs. And in particular, what I'm going to focus on is the extent to which those regulations are engaged, where an art market participant, or AMP, is selling a digital work of art, or for ease, an NFT pertaining to a digital work of art. Could I have the next slide, please, Sarah? Thank you. Uh, the question is not an abstract one, not, not purely an academic one. We've heard a lot about the Beeple every day, and, and here it is. Uh, this sold, as we've heard, for getting on 70 million US dollars a little earlier this year. The point I have to make is this. If sales of this nature are to represent an ever increasing proportion of the total value of sales in the art market. The question of whether customer due diligence, CDD, has to be applied in respect of those high value sales, HMRC might tell you, it matters very, very greatly. Can we have the next slide, please, Sarah? 
by way of brief reminder of the core principles that go to applicability of the MLRs in this context. The MLRs apply where an art market participant is dealing, amongst other things, in works of art. That's the key term highlighted in the middle of the page. It's clear and it's well established that not every part of a regulated business, and therefore here, not every sale that an art dealer might make will automatically be caught by the regulations just because some are. Authority for that proposition in this context is found in the Banff guidance, the British Art Market Federation guidance at page seven, which says to quote briefly, for those AMPs which engage in a mixture of regulated and unregulated transactions, the MLRs will apply to the regulated transactions only. So back to our question, which side of the business then do sales of what I'm calling digital art fall into, the regulated or the unregulated? We have the next slide, Sarah. A work of art for the purposes of our money laundering regulations is defined with reference to the VAT Act for ease, largely. And section 21 of the VAT Act sets out a number of different headers of works of art. I've highlighted just one at the top of that slide. I won't go through them all, but this one at the top, I think, is particularly helpful in this context. A work of art is taken to include any mounted or unmounted painting, drawing, collage, remember that one, decorative plaque or similar picture that was executed by hand. I think much turns on that. I'll come back to why momentarily. Can I have the next slide and then skip over one please Sarah? That's it. So here it is then. On this slide I set out some of the competing arguments for and against the proposition should digital art fall within the scope of the money laundering regulations. I should say at the outset that what I've got here is by necessity, because of the time we've got a simplification. Much will of course turn on the particular nature of the NFT, terms of contract and so on. But I hope these pointers give at least some food for thought. I'll start with the two simplest of the arguments for and against. I have dealt with HMRC as a money laundering supervisor for a number of years, principally in its capacity as supervisor for the high value dealers sector. And this encompasses jewelers, this encompasses luxury goods retailers. And in the course of advising clients in those sectors, I very often found that HMRC is particularly quick, not unreasonably, this is not a criticism, HMRC is particularly quick to alight upon the simplest and the broadest possible interpretation of these regulations, the MLRs, for which it is the supervisor. So in our current context, I can imagine the dialogue with our hypothetical NFT art dealer and HMRC going as follows. HMRC might say that you, gallery, or whoever it is, are a high value art dealer. That's your business. You've marketed this particular work extensively as a work of art. You've sold it, describing it on your own terms as a work of art and you've commanded an extremely high price for it on the basis that it's a work of art. Putting all that together, you can't, gallery, dealer, whoever it might be, have it both ways. You can't sell the thing as a work of art and then tell us, your regulator, it's outside the regulation because it's not a work of art. Simple but compelling. There's a simple but compelling argument that goes the other way, of course, and that's the top of my no column. Digital art, NFTs, computer code, None of these things are on the VATAC list, which we just looked at. The VATAC list of works of art is there to give some certainty as to what is and what isn't a work of art for both VAT purposes and by transposition AML purposes. If it's not on the list, it's not caught. Again, superficially an attractive argument. So switching back to the other side of our hypothetical debate, what does HMRC want to say in response to that. Well, I think there are two particularly good arguments that can be deployed at this juncture to argue that the digital art is a work of art for AML purposes. Firstly, I go back to our VAT Act list. And remember the section I highlighted at the top of the slide, um, a work executed by hand. All digital art, to at least some extent, is going to have been executed by hand. Those being the operative words of the particular subsection of the VAT Act. Again, focusing on, on the Beeple to give this some tangible form, is the Beeple not a collage executed by hand? Now it might be said it's executed by machine, that's different. 
But I suggest that's no different to saying a painting is executed by brush. The instrument in the hand of the artist is not determinative of the artistic outcome. A second point HMRC would likely rely upon is expert evidence. In cases of this nature, which I've reminded myself of in the course of preparing for this short section, where the issue of is it a work of art is before the courts, the courts naturally and reasonably place great reliance on the expert evidence before the court. The expert evidence in this case from the art world would very likely be to the effect of, if it's our people, that that is a work of art. Why? Because the artistic community perceive it to be a work of art. So is all lost then for the cause of no? Well, I don't quite think so. Going back to my no column and the last two points on there, Charles um, Cochrane in his section put the points better than I was going to put it. I think Charles, to paraphrase badly, said something like, art is a physical thing. And that very much is my second point on the no section. The common denominator in the VATAC lists of all of those heads of work of art, sculptures, statues, pictures, is that they're tangible. They have some physical corporal form. And again, the VATAC list is concerned or can be concerned with works of art crossing borders and the taxation treatment on importation. That simply is not where we are with digital art and NFTs. The thing doesn't have physical form. It seems properly arguable to me, therefore, that the VATAC list is simply too far removed from what we're talking about, and therefore digital art can't be construed as falling within it. If that's right, it's not a work of art, CD requirements are out with. And then finally, I've got a point called floodgates on my slide. This might also be called unintended consequences, because remember, HMRC does two things, or at least two things, collects taxes, but it also uh, regulates for AML purposes, lately and most recently the art market. So consider this, if HMRC designates digital art as a work of art for the purposes of the money laundering regulations, what knock-on consequences does that have in its other sphere, in terms of tax treatment and in terms of collection of tax? What other sorts of digital media, of computer code, might by near analogy also be works of art so as to attract favorable tax treatment? Is that a consequence HMRC would welcome? I suggest to you possibly not. To put it shortly, they must be careful with how broadly they define work of art for fear of trespassing upon tax collection. So where does all that leave us to put it together? Well, I'm afraid there's no clear or definitive answer. What I can say to you is that if you were visited with this issue in practice, if you had to ask yourselves, what are my CDD obligations? I would say to you that the cautious approach, which is often the better approach when it comes to matters regulatory, would be to treat the NFT artwork sale as a sale of a work of art and conduct the CDD checks. Why? Well, to take you back to one of my first arguments, I'm very sure that that, in these circumstances, facts depending, would be what HMRC would expect you to do. I'll pause there and hand back to you, Robert. Thank, thanks very much, Alan. There's, there's already a, a question in the Q&A, which I shall be coming back, back to you on. But, but, but before that, um, uh, the final, uh, final section, um, Alice Fink is going to talk to us about transferring NFTs. Over to you, Alice. Thanks very much, Roland. Um, yes, in, in, in many respects, um, uh, the way I'm, I'm approaching this is, is slightly slightly different from, from my, my colleagues in, in as much as um, I'm, I'm coming from the starting point that I'm always assuming that the NFT is capable of being transferred, but as we've already already heard, we need to uh, check the T's and C's carefully to make sure that that is, that is the case. And so I'm, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a collector or um, perhaps an artist who's minted NFTs but not yet sold them, um, or potentially an artist who sold with resale rights and looking at, at transferring those retail resale rights. I am particularly focusing here on death because, um, well, apart from nothing being certain other than death and taxes, um, and I'm not even 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 though I would love I could spend hours talking about the tax in relation to NFTs, I'm I'm not going to here. Um, the treatment in relation to making a gift of an NFT would very much follow what I'm going to say about transferring on death. The other thing I'm, I'm, I'm putting aside are questions about whether or not the NFT itself has value after, after death, which is always something that has to be considered. So Ben mentioned that the Kings of Leon um, latest album, which was released as an NFT, um, 
And one of the things that, that um, Kings of Leon did there was they had, they had six, um, six NFTs, which provided lifetime tickets to front row seats for the band's future shows, which of course, as soon as a lifetime comes to an end, has no, has no intrinsic value itself. So, so questions there about whether the owner of, of the, or owners of those particular NFTs have just been left with um, a digital album. Um, an interesting question for, for another day about, about what, what value that NFT still has. But the main, the main, um, the main answer here is that the, uh, the, the, the good news is that um, NFTs are like any other asset and can be transferred on death via a will. Um, they are um, the main, the main thing is making sure that um, your executors know that you have an NFT or, or more and know where to get, um, where to find the details of them. As Ben mentioned, tracing that asset um, shouldn't be a problem if you know it's there, but knowing it's there may be problematic. And that's, and that's the main thing I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, whoever has the private key, which is either the alphanumeric password or the seed phrase, can transfer ownership. So we have a question here about how you prove who the owner is. Um, and that is potentially a tricky thing because we have no central register to confirm the ownership of the crypto asset. Um, we're back at what I call the Swiss bank account conundrum, which is, which is no, not such a, 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 a big thing as it was. But in, in, in my head, I'm thinking of those, those gangster movies where somebody is tied to a chair and being tortured to disclose their private bank account number so that somebody can then go, go to Switzerland and, and acquire all of the assets or so. Um, if, you, if you've, uh, or one, of those, one of those films where somebody just rocks up with the right numbers and the right code and is able to access all of, all of that asset value from, from, from a bank account. Whoever has the details can access the NFT and, and, can, and can transfer it or um, sell it. Um, so there's a real question about here, here about who, who you trust. So the main, the main point I wanted to talk about, um, which uh, we'll move on to the next slide, slide is some practical considerations around um, what, what needs to be thought about. If we were in a room, I would ask for a show of hands at this point of how many people recognize this chap on my slide. Um, and this is Gerald Cotton, who uh, was the founder of Quadriga CX, um, which at one point was believed to be the largest crypto exchange in Canada until it, and it ceased operations in 2019. Cotton died in 2018. He was only 30. He was on honeymoon in India when he died from a complication from Crohn's disease, which is um, on, on its own an incredibly sad thing. Um, but what's interesting for us is the major crypto headache that this created. Because when Cotton died, he was the only person who knew the alphanumeric passwords to the accounts holding the funds invested via Quadriga. So an estimated quarter of a billion dollars disappeared into the ether, leaving about 75,000 investors, leaving more than a little bit aggrieved that their investments had, there was no way to access their investments because the passwords had died with cotton. As you might imagine, there are already plenty of conspiracy theories about whether or not um, Jerry Cotton actually has died, but I'm not going to go down. If you, if you want to explore that further, there are plenty of articles online. Um, but what I think is really interesting about this is whether or not this, um, this particular event will break the idea of the untraceability of digital assets um, and their unrecoverability if you've lost the passwords or you've um you, you may recall there was an article or a report about about somebody who'd managed to dispose of a um a hard drive and it had gone off to landfill and they were desperate to get that landfill that um hard drive back from landfill 
because it had the relevant passwords for them to access. Um, that was a that was a cryptocurrency account, but the same is true for for NFTs. So, what's the answer? And from a very practical perspective, it's to make an inventory. Um, if you are an owner, a collector, or an artist who's minted NFTs, it's to make sure that you have a list somewhere which is kept stored, kept very securely, but kept up to date, which details how or where or what those passwords or, um, or key phrases are. One point I will just make is that it's not a good idea to include that information in the will itself, because once somebody has died, the will becomes a public document. So um, you may inadvertently be disclosing it to the world, which is, is not the ideal. So the first, the first option, I suppose, is to write it down and keep it in a safe. Um, and that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with, with the uh, CryptoPunk that Charles shows, showed us earlier. Um, my, in, in, in my um, imaginary scenario, somebody gets that, um, that QR code in its beautifully sealed envelope and hands it over to their lawyer with their will saying, keep this for me, it tells you all about my NFT. Um, the other option, of course, is, or the next option is digitally. Um, but computers and phones break and software becomes obsolete between creation. I could see it being very much that NFTs are a big thing now, but if the market doesn't go um, the way, it, it, or, or perhaps if the market follows what, what Charles was talking about and, it, and it's actually a bubble and the bubble bursts, then in 10 years time, will those notes about NFTs be somewhere forgotten and, and um, only by digging around through somebody's hard drive will you find that information. Um, there's, that also comes back to my, my point about whether or not we're actually going to get into a place where a lot of the um, digital wallets and digital wallet providers will be able to have a sort of backdoor mechanism if somebody can prove that they're the executor to an estate so that they can, um, perhaps with the production of a death certificate um, or other and or other information I can imagine them wanting perhaps the grant of probate then give access to those codes to that one person or, or two people if it's if it's more than one executor so executors still need to know where to look to find the information and how to access the systems or secure locations um, so the um and the, the next thing I've seen is um, some some crypto exchanges, this is the third, the third point on, on my slide, some crypto exchanges are recommending that um, uh, keys or seed phrases are, are stored in, because of cut in half and stored in two different um, places, so that safe one has got the first half of your phrase and safe two has got the second half of your phrase. Again, as the executor, you need to know to be able to put those two back together. Um, or a digital wallet in which all of those phrases and alphanumeric passwords are stored um, and then you just need to pass on the the details to that one wallet and everything else is is within there um, the next the next thing to consider is if you've got that digital um, digital connection then if you need something like two-factor authentication um, as an executor you'd also have to have access to somebody's smartphone to then be able to do the second stage of two-factor two authentication, um, which is, is, it's a small thing, but it could easily be the thing that, that scuppers whatever it is you're trying to do or the access you're trying to get to those digital assets. Um, the, final, the final one in, in, this, in this particular list, I've got a couple more points to make, but I will, I'm conscious of time, so I will, I will keep it brief. Um, is, is to go back to what Alex, Alex was saying earlier around, around the terms and conditions, is to check your terms and conditions to see whether there will be any restrictions on sharing the details of how to access your, um, your NFTs um, during, your, during your lifetime. Um, because you do, the last thing you want is to, by providing that information to a, another person for the purposes of um, making sure that your succession works, to somehow be falling foul of, of the conditions on which you've got the asset in the first place and um, inadvertently 
perhaps um, creating difficulties or, or, or making it worthless. So the risk remains, as soon as details are shared, they can be misused, the asset could be stolen, as I mentioned before, it's all a question of trust. Um, and the other, the other point on, on which, um, which, which Ben touched on right at the beginning was, if you've got two people who have access to the key, how do you, it could be a joint ownership scenario, how do you prove who, whose it is? Um, it could be a trust relationship. It, it, it could be, um, it could just be that two people are also or have jointly invested and therefore um, have joint ownership. Um, my, my point around this is, it's very important um, to, to make sure that those relationships are, are documented, that even if it's not a, a formal document, you can imagine with a trust, there might be a trustee or a declaration of trust to sit alongside, but um, if it's a, a, a joint ownership scenario, that there's a piece of paper that somewhere that says we own this asset jointly, and that that information is communicated to um, either the person who you've asked to act um, in the future in sorting out the succession, um, or the person that you've asked to, to draft the will and, and put all of that together. Um, I said at the beginning that I could, I could also talk for quite a long time about tax, and um, the only point I wanted to flag is that this is a, an, an area that HMRC has not quite got its head around yet. Um, there is some, um, some commentary around cryptocurrencies um, and the taxation of crypto, but I have not yet seen anything about NFTs. Um, I will keep, keep watching and, and, and see when that pops up. Um, and there, there, are, there are points that with my tax head on, I'm thinking about in relation to where assets are located, what would count as a, a, a remittance for remittance basis users if, if they are um, moving around the world and they've uh, got NFTs, where, where, is it, where is it located for those, for those purposes? But I will, I will pause there because that is a whole other topic um, and not one for today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice, and, uh, and all our other speakers. Um, there's an opportunity now for, for, for to, to, to ask questions. As, as I said at the outset, if, if 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 you have a question, please could you use the the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen? Um, we do have um, a couple already, and and Alan, I warned you earlier that I was going to send one your way. Um, uh, the, this question is: How are the auction houses managing AML and KYC for digital currency buyers? And that's, a, I guess, a source of funds issue. Well, I, um, I don't want to pretend and I, I, I don't have um, a cross-sector insight into how, um, how, how, how auction houses as a whole are dealing with it. What I can say uh, with reference to conversations I've had with people in the market who are interested in this sort of thing is that two points have resonated more than others. And the two points which I find resonate most with those trying to solve this conundrum are firstly that we're not dealing with some homogenous commodity here. The NFT is technically and legally typically different from the next one. So really, and I appreciate it's a bit of a lawyer's answer, but there is a substantial case to be made for dealing with these things on a case by case basis. So that's point number one, there is no answer of general application. The second point that resonates most powerfully is well, when, I, when, when I put the point about the view HMRC is going to take, and to put it again bluntly, do you really fancy telling HMRC that the thing you're selling as a work of art isn't a work of art for the AML regs? Is that an argument you fancy having? The answer that comes back is always, well, no. And I often say to people that if you think that CDD obligations are difficult and onerous, debating it with HMRC, who've got all sorts of powers over you, is significantly worse. So the cautious approach does tend to win out. Thanks, Alan. Um, the next question that's come up, I think, Ben, I'm going to, I'm going to fire this one at you, if, if I may. Um, what would you recommend to potential buyers to safeguard themselves from risk of their assets, such as sleep minting or rug pools? Can or should this assurance be provided by the platform providing the sale uh, by way of vetting artists? I think, I, think, I think maybe telling us what sleep minting and rug pools are, start with, would be useful. <laughs> 
So, so those are things that, that Alex uh, Alex alluded to in yeah. her talk, and essentially, it's someone like minting a second copy of, uh, of Beeple's work and then and then going out and selling it. It's 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 effectively reminting um, an NFT which has already been issued, uh, and, and obviously Alex touched on some of the issues which which are engaged in that regard, and and ultimately. I don't think that any of these marketplaces, and Alex will express her view, I don't think any of these marketplaces are remotely interested in undertaking that kind of due diligence and are not going to accept liability for that. So unless it's imposed by them by some kind of statutory theory, I think it's, it's, it's caveat emptor. Yeah, I would agree, Ben. I think um, some of the platforms are making noises about the fact that they know they need to do something, but actually substantively haven't done much yet. There is a blue tick appearing against some artists on some platforms, which apparently is supposed to show some level of diligence in the same way that if you are, you're an Instagram user, you might be familiar with the genuine celebrity having a blue tick against their name and uh, all of those copycat um, fa or fan accounts not having a blue tick, but, but it, it's not terribly sophisticated. And I think the only practical advice I can give to artists at the moment is, is something around digital rights management. So when your works are available digitally online, what you want to do is to prevent downloading or copying of those artworks without your consent. And there are technical measures which can be taken by watermarking or by preventing the copying or download of things. That to me seems unfortunately the, the most practical way at the moment of preventing um, counterfeit NFTs. Uh, as I say, and I agree with you, Ben, the platforms are not providing a huge amount of of the marketplace is not providing a huge amount of help at the moment. I think in the future, we will see some sort of takedown policies being implemented by the marketplaces, a bit like if you go onto eBay or Amazon, those all have takedown policies, which they've had to um, implement, um, partly through uh, legislative measures, but also partly through customer demand and trust. I think we will see something like that, but uh, it's a long way behind um, the physical uh, purchase and counterfeiting world at the moment. Thanks both for that. Um, the, the next question I've got, Charles, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to field this one. I think it will become apparent why. How would you educate a traditional non-crypto art buyer in buying crypto art and NFTs? You're on, you're on mute. Yeah, what a okay. question. Um, yeah, um, gosh. Yeah, luckily, my, my answer was to, to, to my imaginary buyer was just wait. Um, and, and, um, and I think that's what I would say to someone who's new to any form of buying art is, is find out an awful lot more about the art that you're interested in before you start buying. It means talking to someone like me who's independent. It means doing a lot of thinking and reading and looking. And one of the problems about NFTs is it's quite hard to see... Um, all the, the NFTs that have been produced because there are no books about them. Uh, um, and, and on top of that, there's no critical framework. There are no, art, there are no um, critics or academics looking. And, and so it, it's always your view. It's not the view of a sort of received, uh, received wisdom. And part of, of that is, is all based on how NFTs got made in the first place. They didn't want to get involved with dealers and galleries and museums. They wanted to be a commune away from all of that sort of commercial pressure. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm afraid all I can really say is, um, I would be extremely cautious, uh, first of all, working out the difference between, is this a crypto market funded and not funded, but, but, uh, the enthusiasm is from crypto people who are part of that world or, or are they really interested in the art? And at the moment, my feeling is the art is not necessarily of the greatest quality, frankly, um and um so that that's something i'd look at who's really who's buying at the moment and we don't know and and then and then if you're really still interested is, is to is to is to, one, one could do nothing else but become um, interested by reading and looking as much as you can and 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 starting and starting small as it were because i think yeah but it's we're all of us a bit we're all of us a bit sort of um you know, caught up in the in the values of some of some of these yeah. NFTs over the over recent months. But my understanding is that the, the vast majority of the market in volume terms is a, is at much much lower levels. Much. Of value. Yeah, I think that's 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 very right. So you could start as a speculative level 
by just simply buying what you like because it won't hurt your wallet too much by buying from the artists who have not become overnight sensations i think buying something that's really through christie's or sotheby's um that that's a different process you know you can end up spending an, a, a lot of money and i wouldn't want to be holding um people's big work the five thousand first, you know his first five thousand days because goodness i mean would you ever be able to sell that again for the same amount maybe maybe we'll all be proved wrong and, and this this market is going to continue i wouldn't want to be left holding that I think Charles, Charles I, I think one of the really interesting questions is why why are you purchasing the work as a buyer what's your motivation yeah good question um because I think for a lot of people if I was to put it very bluntly this is about being the first or, or mm. some sort of I've heard it referred to in the American market as bragging rights <laughs> I suppose um and, and, I, and I wonder whether that's also an important factor for a buyer is to say well what, what's my motivation here as you say is it about the underlying quality of the mm. art or is it something else well, uh, I think that's that's right. Bragging bragging rights are great if, if the thing you've got is is worth bragging about. But if that that slides down to being worth nothing, then obviously there's not much to talk about. Um, we we'll certainly brag about. Um, it's I, I think I think any artist, uh, sorry, any collector's got to work out why are they buying something. Do they really like what they're looking at? And one of the gaps that I've I've tried to talk about is between the sort of interest in the crypto world as opposed to the actual physical, the actual art quality of what they're producing. And, and I think there's quite a big gap there. So I, I would ask a buyer um, to really ask why are they interested in buying uh, an NFT for a, for, from, visual, from a visual point of view? I would just add also, I think there's a salutary lesson to be learned from the uh, stonk market um, and the Wall Street Bets um, episode uh, of earlier this year. Um, ultimately, uh, as in that case, what was a quite a sophisticated and clever idea at its core to attack short sellers um, um, was successful and some people made lots of money. Um, other people were left holding the baby um, uh, and valueless um, stocks uh, in, in the company's uh, AMC and um, uh, GameStop uh, and others and uh, and ultimately I, I suspect that that may ultimately be the case here that, that I think the stock market's been quite unusual over the past um, 12 months and uh, during during the pandemic um, and there's there are participants in the market that haven't traditionally participated um, in that regard and I suspect that's probably true in this market too so um where it ends up i think is is is, is a matter of interest but the, you know we've, we've obviously seen significant fluctuations in in the value of bitcoin over the course of this year and i suspect this market is going to be um certainly prone to those kinds of fluctuations and if someone's buying to make a short-term profit that there, there are obviously a lot of risks attendant in that sort of strategy well ben did you did you um show a, one of the crypto punks but it, it, with a sale value in the millions of dollars, I think, in your first slide. I think you did. And, yeah, and it, was, it, was, it was one for, for, for sale at 11 million, and I wouldn't, uh, on a personal one, this is probably a Philistine uh, expression, uh, I wouldn't personally consider it particularly distinct from any of the uh, 9,999 other ones. Yeah, and the trouble is, is that Sotheby's, last week, there were five crypto punks, and I, I featured one of them, and, and the top price was two, just over $200,000, a pound, sorry. And, and it's, it's slightly different, obviously, because you're buying a print, but uh, as well as everything else. And, and the one I showed was 150000 Now, I don't know how they compare, but that's one of these big issues. How, uh, why is that $11 million going for so much more? Um, and, and, and are we looking at prices in Sotheby's way under what happened earlier um, and is it just volatility i mean question question that's the problem there are so many questions here from an art perspective th th thanks for all on that with the questions have come a couple more come come, uh, come in um again this is this is on, on similar lines do you see nfts as a way to connect the art and finance worlds um charles does that how does that oh, sound God. to you <laughs> Um, um, I, I think if, if the question is, is it easier for people to, um, with money to, to spend their money <laughs> um, that much more easily, 
Um, I, I suspect it probably is. Um, uh, I guess. It, it, do do the people are, are the people who have got lots of money in the finance world? Do they know what they're buying? I, I wonder. Um, uh, so it. it whether it's easier, I don't know. Whether it's a sensible thing, if that's actually a better question, I don't know. Um, one of the dangers, I mean, I can if you could take a step into a more established market, is um, people uh, forming friendships effectively with people that own galleries on Bond Street, and, and through that friendship and, and a great lack of knowledge, but the, the but the, the gallery owners being extremely good salesmen. Um, physical works of art by well-known artists just selling for 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Uh, they're not worth that. I mean, they're, they're just not. Um, and, and I find clients come to me saying, I, I need a third party valuation, you know, an independent valuation. And it's clear that, 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 that there's a very difficult relationship. And so you could say, go, you know, if you're a fin financial world, go, just go to a gallery in, in Bond Street and you can spend your money if that's what you want to do. I think the key thing is, of what value are you getting? Uh, Alex, I know you've got to drop off in a moment, but I want to just put one more question to you. This is from a, from a museum perspective, and it's rather an interesting one. Um, if a museum wants to buy NFTs, they're obviously going to hold them. That The whole purpose is to hold them long term. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question arises about story, as it were, storage in inverted commas and keeping them safe. And the question of rights from the artist or the estate of the artist to copy the work in order to have a backup mm. on hard disks or servers. Mm. Can, you, can, you, can you offer any thoughts on, on, on that issue? Yes, I mean, there are, there are limited exceptions to copyright infringement to provide for some of these circumstances already. I must admit, I don't have the provisions in front of me at my fingertips, but it'd be worth, certainly worth looking at those to see whether you already fall within an exception in terms of having um, backup copies. Um, I think the exceptions are, are, are around where it's 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 sort of impossible to um, view a work without having it having a copy made on your machine in order to view it. So you may you may and again it depends on the jurisdiction fall within an existing copyright exception. Um, and I suppose the, the much more difficult question, and this is probably more a Ben question than me, is this point around making sure that it's future-proofed in terms of accessibility. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Somebody in my team the other day said to me, I'm reading a very old contract. I've seen a reference to something. What is a floppy disk? Um, and I felt old. And, and we talked about what happened before we had USB sticks and everything else, and we had floppy disks, and whether they were five and a quarter inch or three and a half or whatever. Um, you know, that's only a few years ago, really, and te technology just moves on. So I think, I think the question for museums around how to make sure that these are in, a, in, a, in a, a readable format for the future is a very good one. I'm not sure I have answers. And, and, and I think also, it knocks on the bend, Delighted to hear your comments, but also insurance. We haven't touched on insurance at all. But but it, but if but if the the, the your, your your token is linked to a, to a digital asset on a uh, effectively on a computer that crashes or is no longer maintained, what have you got of any value? And, and can you should you be insuring against that? Yeah, and, and obviously, can you mint a new copy uh, of of that work without infringing copyright? Uh, uh, which, which is which is a potential issue. Um, they, as I alluded to in my um, in my uh, uh, slides, there's a, there's uh, uh, there are solutions basically to this issue being developed, where you, you effectively have a, a large file blockchain, which is developed to enable people to have this sort of ongoing immutable access to um, to their files. Um, so there are solutions out there on the market. There are also people. Um, proposing to offer insurance for this 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 kind of issue um, as well, so I think it's it's probably a case of um, uh, the the world, uh, at least in, in NFT terms, moving slightly faster than the traditional um, art world, um, and uh, the sort of players around that market um, playing catch up. And, and obviously, you're still seeing this in crypto. So to sort of speak to a, to, a, to a point which Alice was talking about, one of the things which I've seen more recently is um, storage facilities where you basically physically burn your um your wallet um or rather your, your digital key onto a piece of metal which is then held in a, in a temperature controlled storage facility um 
So there's there's whole new markets which develop around around these products and which are continuing to develop around these markets. Uh, uh, and uh, um, and we'll, we'll no doubt see more as long as the market justifies it. And the, and the question is whether um, after the initial um, uh, whether 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 what we've seen in the market so far is froth, or whether there will be um, uh, a sort of continued level of appetite for these kinds of products. Thank, thanks, and that, uh, that's a, a, a futuristic but traditional way, um, <laughs> perhaps, to end. We have reached the end of our allotted time. I'm very sorry. There are there are still some questions out there that we we haven't answered um, yet. Um, do do please feel free afterwards to to contact any of us. Um, uh, on, on our email addresses um, but it remains for me to thank thank everyone uh, for attending but also thank you all our all our speakers uh, for what I, I hope has been a thoroughly um, engaging and an interesting session thank you very much we look forward to seeing you next time goodbye